Okay, so hi everybody, welcome to the next episode of Bay Street Capital Holdings podcast titled, How'd You Do It and Why Should I Care? This series aims to highlight women doing amazing work in various industries. So today we are so lucky to be joined by Jessica Hazard, who is a change agent, social justice advocate, educator, and co-conspirator. So Jessica, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, so my name is Jessica Hazard. I currently work at Texas Christian University, known as TCU, um, in the athletic department. I have been here nine years. Um, I am, I guess by title, I'm the Associate Athletic Director for Student Athlete Development and also um, Diversity, Equity and Inclusion. So I manage kind of all of the programming for our student athletes, which is about 500. Um, and I also oversee all of our diversity, equity, and inclusion for the entire department. So staff, coaches, and the student athletes. Awesome. Well, it's absolutely lovely to meet you. Um, I guess my first question would be, what inspired you to join this industry and follow and pursue the path of diversity and inclusion? So um, I've, I've sort of, in my career path, had several iterations of work. And I would say this is, I guess, technically my third career change when I moved into athletics, um, which was sparked by law school. So I went to law school later in life. I was 32 when I attended law school. Um, I was going thinking I was going to do um, like juvenile justice reform work. I was in the juvenile justice world prior to this um, and got there and sort of halfway through had a mentor who I needed an internship and I had a mentor and he said, where do you want to intern? And I said, with the Oakland Raiders, because I was a big Raider fan before they moved to Vegas, by the way. Um, and he said, I can get you that job. So I interned for the Oakland Raiders for a couple years and I played college sports and sort of I've always been around athletics. And so I made the switch to college athletics, um, which I didn't realize my kind of worlds would recollide uh, the way they did. I've always worked in kind of DE&I spaces before we were calling it DE&I spaces, I guess. Uh, through doing direct service or system work or juvenile, you know, juvenile justice work, those things all merge into marginalized populations and looking at, you know, pipelines and systems of oppression. Um, and so I ended up in college athletics and through the last nine years have uh, started two different departments <laughs> that didn't exist when I got here. Uh, someone called me an entrepreneur the other day and I had never heard that word. And I was like, Oh, that's a cool word. I like that title. Um, and so, yeah, I just, moved through that space, ended up here and realized we weren't really supporting our student athletes at the time as well as we could be. So started looking at it that way. And then that evolved into realize we weren't supporting our staff and coaches as well as we could be. And so really shifted into um, sort of the, what we know as DE and I work now, where, you know, you're looking at retention and hiring and ERGs and all the things that go into, into supporting your staff and for us staff and student athletes. No, that's really great to hear. And I'm glad that you made that sort of a mission of yours when you started at your new role. So that's great. Um, and you mentioned that you had a mentor as well who helped you in your first few roles. So like what other what resources did you have or what were the best resources that helped you along the way? Yeah, I think, you know, people have been my best resources. Mm -hmm. I, I think like I, I was thinking about this um, cheat notice. She gave me the questions ahead of time. So I had a little chance to kind of look at them. I didn't look too long ahead of time though, because I wanted to be a little more authentic, but I think that people have been my biggest resource. Um, mm -hmm. I've been able to work in a lot of different fields with, with amazing people who have done great things and sometimes crappy people who I realized I didn't want to be like, right? So you gotta take the good with the bad. Um, mm -hmm. From a de and I lens, I, I went to the Cornell ILR school and completed my um, certification for diversity and my professional certification and an amazing program, but an amazing cohort, right? So those are people now who I'm like calling like, hey, how did you get through this when this happened? Or have you ever faced this within, you know, starting up your DEI council or have you ever, so I think people have been my best resource um, kind of my whole life and people I've known for 30 years or known for three years or three months and everybody has been able to fall into place for me and, and building those relationships and not burning bridges probably is the other big one um, mm -hmm. to make sure you can always reach back to people that you're for some reason you're like, Oh, I remember that person from 20 years ago who said this or did this thing that I thought was really cool. I wonder how they did it. And so being able to like continue those relationships in a space where you can reach back when needed. Yeah, for sure. And a follow up question for that, for anyone who might be wondering, how did you establish those mentorship relationships? 
So I think some of them are just organic, right? Sometimes you just work, you are at a job or at school and you have a professor that mentored you or a, you know, advisor of sorts. Um, some of them are people, colleagues you've worked with who just were like, this is a person's really smart and I can bounce things off of, or they're able to connect with you in a different way that maybe they see you differently than other people. Yeah. Um, so I think that you just have to open yourself up to doing that and, yeah. and being willing to, ask questions and reach out to people when you're not sure about something um, and not feel like you either know everything one or are too afraid to ask because mm -hmm. you're afraid of what the result will be. And I, mm -hmm. and I think that that's been one of the big things is to, and one of my things I would say to always do is to ask the question. You know, I, I work with a lot of young people and I always say, ask the second question, you know, like what's the, not just the answer, don't answer the first question, like, or just ask the first question, ask that second question and figure out how to continue those relationships. Yes, for sure. And I'm sure a lot of young professionals starting in the industry will struggle sort of asking the first question, but it's good to know that, you know, it's not as daunting as it seems. It's not, most people want to help. Yeah. Right? Most people generally are like, yeah, what do you want to know? You know, that's what I've found with people. And I'll be like, hey, would you mind, you know, sharing your resume with me? Because, you know, would you mind helping with this job description? Would you mind, and stuff that can be really personal. People are, are pretty, open to helping, I think, that I've found anyway, across Absolutely. kind of every walk of life, so to speak, or business. That's good to hear. Um, so any lessons that you wish you would have learned before starting in the sports industry? Hmm. Well, I don't think I realized how political it was going to be coming really? in. Um, you know, I'd worked in city government, so mm -hmm. obviously political, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I didn't realize how, one, it's a business. College okay. athletics, while we are, you know, while we are uh, supporting people and getting their degrees and those things, it is a multi-million, billion-dollar business. Mm -hmm. um, so people are very serious about it. It's very political and how things get looked at and who gets what and, you know, all those things. And I don't think I realize that as much. Um, I also think the other thing that surprised me is if you're coming into athletics from outside athletics, the majority of people that work in college athletics has have worked in college athletics basically their whole lives. Mm -hmm. So kind of the pipeline is right. You go to school, you become a graduate assistant of sorts at an athletic department, and then you get an entry level job and then you just keep going. So mm -hmm. several of my colleagues have never left a college campus since they went to college. Wow. Right? They've just worked there forever. And so mm -hmm. it's a very sort of, um, I don't know, a certain culture that people are really used to. And if you come in, and challenge the culture, people are a little like, wait, what? Mm. And it's because it's been that way for so long. And I think now we're seeing, you know, obviously with the DE and I work and being challenged, coaches being challenged, for example, by student athletes and what their rights are and how they want to be treated and stuff. So we're now having to start to have some better conversations about what it looks like to support student athletes, which is our job, yeah. right? Um, and our coaches and staff in the same same world. Oh, it's, that, it's good to see that the perspective is changing and people are sort of speaking up a lot more as well. Yeah, we're getting there, man. Those Gen Zers. I love <laughs> them. They're my favorite, best generation ever is Generation Z. That's they're, good to hear. That's good they to hear. Are, yeah, <laughs> they're, they're yeah. challenging all of us to be better. No, that's good to hear. So I guess this is a tough question and I, you knew it was coming, but what's your biggest failure and what did you learn from it? Uh, so I guess, you know, one, I, I don't know that when I was look at the question, I was thinking, I don't know that I look at things in sort of successes and failures per se. Mm -hmm. um, but I was thinking that, and I don't know if it's a failure as much as a, I wonder what would have happened if situation. Um, when I was in college, um, my, one of my mentors, uh, Dr. Sandra Sanderford, um, I was a black studies minor and she was kind of my mentor through the department, the black studies department. And I was, I think I must've been in my senior year ish. And I, I was like ready. She's like, what are you going to do when you graduate? And I'm like, I'm going to go do like work in juvenile services. Like that was what I wanted to do. And she was like, no. And I'm like, what, what do you mean? No. Like, that, what are you talking about? No. Like, yes, that's what I want to do. And she's like, you should, that's not what you should do. And I was, I was like, well, what do you mean? And she said, um, there are very few white people in the community that understand and have done work and that are advocating for people of color. 
Mm -hmm. um, people of color are always advocating for people of color, but very mm -hmm. few white people. And this is 20 plus years ago, right? So we talk about allyship a lot now. We didn't even have a, we didn't even call it that then. I never even, it wasn't even like a word that was used, right? Allyship wasn't really used back then, yeah. um, the, to my knowledge at least. And I said, well, so she's like, I feel like you could have a greater impact in other spaces. Like mm -hmm. you could do so much more to advance systems. Um, and I and I didn't listen. So I, I'm not <laughs> sure if that's really a failure, but I always wonder what would have happened had I done that. And when I look back, she wasn't wrong. Um, my career path have always shifted out of individual work to system work. Every time I do like individual kind of direct service type work, mm -hmm. I end up being like, nope, this isn't enough. We need to change the system. So mm -hmm. in kind of every career move I've done, that's where I've ended up is on the system side of things. Yeah. So she wasn't wrong. Um, I still talk to her. So she, she knows that I, I know she wasn't wrong. Uh, yeah. But I also often wonder like, what would happen had I started doing that earlier? So I don't know mm -hmm. if it's a failure per se, but maybe a failure to listen and a failure to understand that sometimes other people know you better mm -hmm. than, than you know yourself at certain times in your life. Yeah. Wow. I guess my follow up from that would be you mentioned you were uh, working a lot in systems. Uh, have there been any times where you've sort of challenged the system and sort of had to follow through with that? Um, well, anyone who knows me that's listening to this is laughing because um, I always am challenging the system, like no matter what, mm -hmm. uh, sort of my MO. And I, I think, yeah, I mean, I, I was able to start two departments here because I challenged the system as it was mm -hmm. and didn't think we were doing enough. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've now added added programming for student athletes. Now we've and those are culture changes. And people yeah. don't like cold people don't like change. Mm -hmm. Um, so you have to sort of figure out who your allies are, who who's gonna help you champion these things and buy in, and who's not, and how do you get to them? Mm -hmm. And how do you get the buy-in? How do you, you know, maneuver this in a way that makes sense? DE and I, this is very typical in DE and I work, especially, right? When you're looking at maybe your um, administration or your, your corporate, your C-suites. And they're like, mm, we actually do really well as a company. Why would we change anything? Right. Yeah. Right? So ha being able to figure out how to, you know, that we call it the with them, like what's in it for me, like mm -hmm. working with people and building relationships enough to understand what, what is it for them? So mm -hmm. you can take that motivation and figure out how to apply strategies. And I think that's in anything, anytime you're trying to change something, you've got to find kind of this personal connection or they are they feel bulldozed right like they feel like they're not a part of this conversation and i think with d and i specifically that's a lot a lot of people are like well this isn't about me i don't feel like i'm a part of this yes yeah. Yeah. which yeah. is felt false right like white people were diverse right <laughs> we're, we're part of the d even though sometimes they don't think we are we don't think we are mm -hmm. uh you know so i think it's it's a uh, it's just like figuring out how to build a relationship to be able to affect the change you want to and it's not going to work for everybody. That's okay. Yeah. But if you can get the tipping point there, you can really do some things. Um, but it takes time and it's frustrating. And you want everyone to see why you're, you want to do the things, you know, why it's yeah. important or why you want to do this. And not everyone does. Yeah, because you've got to sort of sort of tailor your, your argument towards the people who are your allies, but also the people who don't see it from your perspective. And then you've yeah. got to sort of convince them. And <laughs> it's sort of like negotiations in a way. Yeah, absolutely. And if you think about it from an athletics lens, like the big thing is how do we win? Yeah, yeah. How is this going to help us win? Yeah. Right? Which is what we're trying to do. We're all trying to win. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the team angle on it. Yeah. I mean, keeping with this angle, um, what advice would you give somebody who is wanting to pursue a career in the college athletics field? Um. Well, there's no money in it until there is, right? Until you really get the top. So one, be ready that there's no money. Yeah. <laughs> um, you're going to do all kinds of jobs that don't have anything to do with the job you signed up for, mm -hmm. uh, which is how it works. And, you know, I think that asking yourself why, and, and it's interesting because a lot of my student athletes will be like, I want to, I want to stay in athletics, right? Cause they're one, they don't really know what else to do often just because they've been playing their sport for so long. The mm -hmm. idea of not doing that and completely leaving athletics is very hard on identity um, mapping. But I think it's interesting because there's a billion jobs in sport. Like mm -hmm. you can do any, almost anything in sport, right? We have a fine CFO. We have 
someone who does marketing. We have media. We have um, our medical team. We have our mental health team. We have our academics. So really, there's like this big open door to getting into athletics. Um, it's definitely rewarding because you're constantly working with young people, right? Mm -hmm. And you get to watch this kind of evolution of the, of them um, during a time that's a really fun time to work with people, this kind of college age where mm -hmm. they're figuring out who they are, kind of left home and they're working through all the things and, and all the hardships and, and whatnot. But um, athletics is tricky. It's hard. It's a hard industry. You'll move a lot. You'll have to change. You have to be willing to open to move around and change and uh, shift things to get to the next level and go because people won't leave. So, right. You can't really move if someone's not, not leaving, uh, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, you know, I, I go to games like every weekend I'm at a game and every, if you like sports, uh, it's a pretty fun industry to be in. But it's work and it's hard to get into. There's a lot of nepotism mm. in the in the field. Um, you know, a lot of people that work here have parents who did something or a cousin or somebody who, you know, so I think one of the things we're working on with DE and I is hiring, like how do we be do be better about yeah. breaking that down and looking at things um from a different lens. Uh but yeah, I mean I I'm happy if anyone wants to talk about it and they're interested in getting into athletics, I'm ha I'm open. I'm on LinkedIn. So <laughs> Even though Layla couldn't find me, but I'm there. I swear I'm on LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's really awesome to hear. I think the college athletics scene is so vibrant. So there's so much happening. I mean, I'm a lacrosse player myself, but I'm not, I don't play for Penn, but I, like I just admire the college athletes here because they are training full time and also studying full time. And yeah. yet they have time for everything else. So yeah, props to them. And also so to a lot of work driving behind them. Yeah, exactly. A full time job. Yeah, with the whole machine behind them. Yeah. I, I always have, I have two graduate assistants that work for me. Um, and one of them's a former student athlete. And every time I have student, former student athletes who come in, they're always like, I had no idea what was happening behind me. Right. Mm -hmm. Like while I was a student athlete, I had no idea all the stuff happening, you know, over here to make it happen. You know, mm -hmm. the facilities people to make sure the fields are right or the courts right or the, you know, all the technology, all the social media, like everyone who's working, you know, there's 250 employees in our athletic department and 500 mm -hmm. student athletes. So <laughs> we're like two to one <laughs> right, well, to, make, to make it happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of cogs that go into making the machine running. You Absolutely. Know? Yeah. So that's really amazing. So I guess my next question would be, the stage is yours now. So what is one common myth about your profession or field that you would like to debunk? Probably that it's like, everyone's like, oh, that's so sexy. You work in college athletics. How fun is that? Like, And I'm like, yeah, sometimes. Sometimes it's, you know, I, I think probably the most interesting thing is that um, whenever you have a setup, and I, I can't think of where else this really happens other than kind of in sport. I'm sure there's other places, but mm -hmm. our coaches make more money than our senior administrators. Oh, okay. So it's an interesting kind of dynamic where you're often serving a couple people, mm -hmm. right? Where the coach has a lot of influence um, over yeah. how things happen, even though they not not one coach supervises me, right? I don't report to one coach. I report mm -hmm. up to senior to my athletic director, right? I report mm -hmm. to my athletic director. Yeah. But and he's in, in organizational structure over everyone, mm -hmm. and it, but the coaches have so much influence, especially like for example, our football coach has been here like twenty years. Yeah. Um, longer than any of our administrators. Yeah. So it's just an interesting dynamic to come into um, and very hard in some cases for what we call support staff. Yeah. So anybody working to support our student athletes, um, if a coach calls, you answer. Yeah. Right? It's very, <laughs> it's, you know, it's like your boss calling, but they're not your boss. So yes. it is an interesting space to navigate. Um, mm -hmm. I think, and I think as a young person, really hard to kind of know who to, like, what do I do if there's a conflicting yeah thing happening how do i respond to that it's definitely a lot of life skills in this job uh you figure that out but it is an interesting dynamic that i i don't know that i can think of in very many other career paths that you kind of have these multiple powers that be so to speak um running the show okay okay so you must be like sort of on your feet all the day all day and just ready to answer whatever call you get yes and the building's always on fire over here like <laughs> 
everything it has to be like there's there's something i've had people ask me often like what's a day like for you and i'm like well <laughs> um that depends because i can think i'm gonna know what's gonna happen today and then it, it's completely different than what i thought like and then some like a phone rings and you know i've got a, something going on with student out they, they need something a coaches the i mean it can change at any given moment so you have to be ready to that has to be in your personality. You got to know it's got to get done. If someone says, hey, can you do whatever? And you're like, sure. That means, can you do it right now? Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean like put it on your list of when yeah. to do it. It means, can you get it done and get that back to me as soon as possible? Wow. Wow. Yeah. Be ready to be on your feet. And how has that sort of changed or manifested during the COVID pandemic? Right. So um, we've had quite a year. Um, I think unless you weren't paying attention to anything, athletics has been in the media a lot around, right? Like you watch the NBA go in the bubble and mm -hmm. like things were canceled and postponed. And so we've sort of had to figure this out on the fly in a couple ways. Um, our university had hardly any online classes. Oh, wow. Like very few. Wow. That's, that's amazing. You know, it's a, it's a 9,000, 9,000 students a very kind of known for it's like it's selling point is this kind of one-on-one -on -one, you know small classroom instruction thing and we heard hardly any so we watched like all of our student athletes go from being in class in person in every single class to be like oh now we're all 100 online yeah. um, right and then summer school they're almost all here summer school training so people weren't training um several of our sports in spring last year were canceled. So like baseball didn't play track and field, you know, we had a handful um, that were really hard on student athletes. Yeah, I'm sure. To just not have their sport to play anymore. Yeah, um, especially like the seniors as well who were losing their last season. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, so fast forward to January where we were coming back into spring season and mm -hmm. I'm meeting with all these student athletes who lost their seasons last year, mm -hmm. who have all this anxiety around like, are we gonna get to play? Yeah. And, you know, trying to manage COVID restrictions. Uh, we're in Texas, so um, no one here thinks we that COVID exists, I feel like. Like, it was like things were, like, our numbers were crazy um, just because people weren't doing the things that were needed, in my opinion. <laughs> I'm not speaking for the university. Uh, in my opinion, we weren't really doing, the university was doing everything we could, and our poor student athletes were just being held to this very high standard of, like, basically only hang out with your team. Like they're getting tested three times a week. I get tested once a week, mm. uh, you know, to make sure. So it was just a whole added thing. Yeah. And then they didn't even know if they're going to get to play. So, so far, so good. Uh, we're playing. We made it through football season. That's good. Uh, yeah. And yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Uh, we're down a bunch of staff because our university, um, we're on a hiring freeze. Yeah. Because we lost a whole bunch of money. Uh, last year, you know, and so it's, we're kind of figuring it out, but so far we're getting through it. And I know there's a lot of people with a lot of opinions on if we should have even played. Mm -hmm. um, I was very, I, I, I agree. We, we needed to have those conversations. Um, and once we decided to play, we had to just figure out how we could best support you know, our staff and coaches and student athletes in doing that. Um, mm -hmm. Cause again, to play is a lot of people. Yeah. Not just the athletes. Oh, exactly. And it's nice that you put the support of your staff and the athletes first and your for at like, the forefront of whatever you guys were doing. Yeah, I think we're trying. I mean, it's a tricky dynamic, right? It's hard to um I know a lot of people have a lot of feelings about, you know, if it was the smartest thing to do and if we were putting them in, in the you know forefront of it. And so we you know this is where we are and it was something that unprecedented that we didn't everyone was winging it everyone was just like i don't know we're just gonna have to go and try to figure this out and so hopefully we're on the tail end of it i hope we're getting there uh yeah. yep um getting we have a vaccination um one of the hospitals is vaccinated out of our parking lots here at, on campus so mm -hmm. uh, a lot of vaccines going through here every day that i can see so i can see physically see some progress happening which That's is nice, nice. Yeah. yeah but yeah it's tricky i mean yeah, I mean, you seem to have handled it really well. I mean, it's just sort of in the pandemic when it started, it was just sort of what's the next plan? You know, you've got to think on your feet. And obviously in your role, you think a lot on your feet. So I'm sure you right. guys did it really well. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I guess I'm going to switch to some more general questions now. But what have you read or listened to recently that inspired you? Let's see. Um I just finished, I, I, I had hip surgery last year. Actually, today's a year from my 
my first, I had two surgeries, two hip surgeries. My first one was a year ago today. Um, so I watched a lot of things and read a lot of things because <laughs> I was home and COVID and all the other things that happened. So my mom um, always sends me books and I kind of became obsessed with Emily Dickinson during okay. COVID. I started reading a bunch and watching some stuff on her. And so my mom sent me a book called uh, These Fevered Days by, uh, what's her name? Martha Aikman, I think. But it's kind of a cool, it's like 10 pivotal moments in Emily Dickinson's life that are kind of cool. She had an interesting life. She was sort of a feminist before she knew what it was. She oh, was pushing, wow. pushing envelopes and, and pushing boundaries um, as a woman back in the 1800s. So that was kind of interesting. And then I'm finishing, I'm on my last edition of a podcast called Louder Than a Riot, mm -hmm. which is um, hosted by the two um, hip hop and entertainment NPR um, commentators, like mm -hmm. journalists. Mm -hmm. And it's about the connection or lack thereof of um, the connection to hip hop and mass incarceration. And it's oh. really good. Okay, um, I'll so get back to this and that sounds so It's really good. good. Yeah, louder than a riot. I really like it. It's been really highly entertaining. And one of my friends who doesn't listen to podcasts was like, I've been listening to that nonstop. I can't quit listening to it. So that's been interesting. It's it's informative and interesting. And they kind of go by region. They interview mm -hmm. people like on the West Coast, like hip hop artists on the West Coast, and they go to the East Coast and the South and they talk through kind of things that have happened and yeah, systems, <laughs> right? Systems yeah. again. Yeah, we'll make sure to check that out. Um, so my next question is, who are three people who have been the most influential to you in your life? This is a hard question, too. So my friends and I play that game about, like, if you could have dinner with anyone, you know, top five people dead or alive type thing. So I've always, Malcolm X, El Haj Malik Shabazz has always been on that list for me. Um, I think because... I studied him for a long time. Um, when I was in college, I wrote my um, black studies thesis on like the, the balance between Dr. King and Malcolm X and like kind of without Malcolm, you wouldn't have really had Martin. Martin would have been able to do the things he was able to do because basically people didn't want to deal with Malcolm because they thought he was so radical that they mm -hmm. were like, okay, even though Dr. King was very radical, but people mm -hmm. like to frame him in a way that wasn't that radical. Yeah. Um, and so kind of this balance. And I think since then, reading more and more and learning more and more, the thing that I appreciate most about him is his ability to um, learn and, and like correct. Right. So, and, and his life has, he's kind of been through a whole bunch of things in his lifetime. So if you haven't watched Malcolm X, you should watch it, the movie or read the book or anything on him, but he kept evolving as a person and mm -hmm. didn't, didn't get stuck. And like, well, I said this at this time and now I'm just going to do that. And it was like, actually I said this and, and then I went to Mecca and I was wrong. So now I'm going to, you know, or I'm going to challenge this thing that I've told everyone I believe in and I've gotten people to follow. And now I'm going to challenge it because it's not actually showing up the way I think it should have. Yeah. So Malcolm X has always been one of those people who I've always kind of thought about in my mind as I go through my life and not wanting to stay stagnant and always evolving as a person. Mm -hmm. So I would love to have dinner with Malcolm X. Um, and he was very influential in, in my thinking, I think. Um, then let's see. I mean, my, my mom and my parents, right. I'm that's just a given. So I'm going to move. The, I'm like taking my parents out of this because my mom and dad are easily the most influential because they raised me. Um, and I was lucky to have both of them for a long time until I lost my dad. Um, but so I'm gonna move those, those two out of there. Okay. They don't, they're not going to count in this, even though they're in it. Yeah. Um, so many mentors, uh, my best friend Rachel is always a really good influencer for me because she knows me in ways that other people don't. Mm -hmm. so I'm always able to sort of reach out and have her see, she sees things in me differently. Yeah. So when I'm like, what about this? Blah, blah, blah. She's like, actually, you know, remember when you did that? Cause she has so much context. And so she's very influential in my kind of life day to day life. Yeah. Um, so she's amazing. Um, Who's my third? That's a good question. I'm trying to think of like bit work wise. Um, well, clearly Sandra Sanderford had a lot of influence on me that I didn't realize at the time because I'm still talking about her mm -hmm. and the things she said and taught me 25 plus years later. Um, so I'll throw her in there as a kind of my one of my life people that um, we kind of still stay connected loosely, but she has stayed in my brain. 
Mm -hmm. So I guess that's fair to say she's been extremely influential <laughs> to my life, right? That I've never forgotten that she said that to me. She probably forgot she said that to me, but I have not forgotten that she said that to me. So yeah. um, I'll go with those three. Those will be my three. No, that's awesome. And it's nice that you have some long lasting mentors and people in your life who have really helped you along the way. Absolutely. Yes. And my last question is any advice that you wish you gave yourself before embarking on this career journey or just in life in general? I think, you know, two things that I kind of, so one of my little mantras, um, which is really funny. I was at, at a brunch one morning and this young man was waiting on us and he was like, actually, today's my last day. I'm moving to New York. Oh. I'm like, cool. Like, he's like, yep, I've always wanted to be in theater. So I'm, I'm leaving. I'm just going to go. And I was like, that's great. And he said, I'd rather recover than regret. Oh, and I walked off and I was like, wow, like that's profound. So yeah. I would say if you can remember one, recover, not regret. Regret doesn't really do anything for you. You're not really going to be able to, like, you can't really manage regret, but you can recover. Mm -hmm. um, so that's always been something in me. And then I also think, when I think about what Dr. Sandiford said to me when I was talking about failures, um, I think the reason why I went the youth development route and didn't listen to her is because that was easy for me. It was a comfortable space. I knew I could do it. Um, and and that's probably one of the reasons I did it, right? One of the reasons I didn't really challenge myself was because that was easy mm. um, to go that direction. Not that the work's easy, but it was an easy pathway for me. Yeah. Um, so I think I would just say push yourself and don't always do what's easy. Do what you know needs to be done and what's right mm. um, when you can. And you have opportunities to do that a lot, right? In kind of day-to-day -day versus and career. But I think it's, you know, it's easy to do the easy thing. It's just, you yeah. know, it's easy not to push yourself. It's easy to just kind of step into something and be like, oh, this feels good and not push yourself as much. Um, but I would say, I again, I wonder what my life would look like if I had pushed myself harder um, and done the thing that in my gut was telling me to do mm -hmm. and I didn't listen to. No, I completely second that. I think when I was choosing my degree, I was thinking computer science is really difficult for me, but you know what, I'm going to push myself. And it's been the most rewarding degree I've done because it's sort of made me really consider things a lot every single day. So women in STEM, let's go. Yes, yeah, so we love women engineers. <laughs> right, and women of color in STEM, come on, like, let's really go. Like, it's amazing. It's a it's such a cool field and and watching women do great things. Um, I think to my influential list, you know, that's the other thing is I've been really lucky to have a lot of women around mm -hmm. me um, to build me up instead of break me down. Oh, 100%, yeah. I think women have really started to evolve into that space where, you know, kind of historically we weren't great at supporting each other. Mm -hmm. It was sort of just how we showed up. And that's socialized behavior, right? We were socialized to be that way. And and I think the millennials and, and Gen Zers were like, nope, like we're not we're not doing that. Like we're going to support each other and build each other up and and create spaces for women and really cool opportunities. And so I love that. And, and I think that's really important for women to know women. Exactly. And I've definitely benefited myself from women's organizations and, you know, just other women helping me. It's been so, so positive on my sort of attitude, like being away from home as well. Yeah. Helped, yeah. It's amazing. Well, great. Well, thank you so, so much for your time, Jessica. It's absolutely lovely and super inspiring to talk to you today. Thanks. And again, if anyone wants to connect on LinkedIn, please do. I'd love to build my network, obviously. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you and good luck with school. Thank you.